I am Cheryl Brownstein Santiago uh, interviewing uh, Mr. Frank Cruz at uh, the Community Settlement Association of oh, Riverside, Riverside on January 6, 2011. And uh, we really appreciate your having come here today uh, to, uh, to be interviewed. Uh, if you uh, have uh, any questions or, or also if there's anything you wish not to discuss, just let me know uh, so that I can stop the tape. And um, we appreciate your having filled out the form. Uh, I understand that um, you served, your military service was um, in the 19... I want to say 1957 <laughs> to 61. Right. I'm sorry, that's I'm using your HDHD. Yeah, Let correct. me ask you the questions and you can tell me. When were you in the military? I was, uh, I joined the Air Force in September of 1957, and I was discharged from active duty in September of 1961. So I served four years in the Air Force from 57 to 61. Okay, and you were in Air Police? Right. I, I, I did basic training first that all airmen get at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. And shortly thereafter, upon completion of basic training, uh, I was selected to go to air police school training. And uh, I passed, went through all of the training for being an air policeman, and I, sp I spent the remaining four years, if you will, or almost a total of four years as an air policeman uh, uh, for the Air Force. Um, and s your early experience with uh, wartime um, and uh, military uh, people was uh, in your hometown of Tucson, Arizona? That's correct, yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> my mom uh, had a restaurant in Tucson, Arizona called uh, the Columbia Cafe in a little barrio of Tucson called Barrio Hollywood. We call it affectionately that because in many ways it's the opposite of Hollywood here. But uh, at that cafe, my brother and I used to bust dishes and clean uh, the, the, the restaurant for my mom. And um, I've often said that uh, uh, my first exposure to U.S. soldiers was at that restaurant in the most unusual of ways. Um, I often tell people that some of the fiercest fights that I ever saw in my life were at that restaurant between Chicano Latino soldiers that had been in the Korean War who would get into fist fights with soldiers who had been in World War II. And the fight was basically as to who was the bravest and the boldest and who had served the best. And I'm telling you, those fights would range for hours because uh, one side would say the Korean War vets were the toughest and the World War II vets were say ours was the toughest. And I think that's, uh, it was my first exposure and I think it played a key role later on influencing me in uh, joining the Air Force later on. Yeah. And um, after um, you served in the airport, uh, Air Force during the, uh, uh, prior to the Vietnam era, uh, did you see similarities between uh, the soldiers who came out of Vietnam and those with, uh, from uh, Korea and World War II, or were they completely different? Well, you know, I, I think every generation is exposed to a variety of different kinds of uh, societal and environmental forces. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Vietnam War vets, uh, I think, came back to a somewhat hostile nation that uh, uh, a large percentage of the population was not that approving of the war in Vietnam. and. Uh, uh, so therefore, I think there weren't great parades and receptions for the Vietnam veterans when they came. It's beginning to change a little bit, but I think in those days it was uh, to a not so friendly environment. Whereas previous wars, uh, the Korean and World War II, I think uh, 
the reception was better, and there wasn't as uh, obviously as much hostility as there was uh, an antagonism towards the returning vets from the Vietnamese War. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Okay, um, and your experiences um, with veterans from uh, Korea informed your knowledge of how the Cold War developed? Yeah, it did. Obviously, the Korean War ended in 1953 uh, with the truce, the armistice, um, and I joined the Air Force in 57. Uh, I was immediately, shortly after basic training and air police school training, I was sent to the Far East. I was in the Philippines for a short period of time. There, uh, the policing duties, we had a variety of them, but one... Okay, hello. Thank you for coming today. Um, I am Cheryl Brownstein Santiago, uh, interviewing uh, Mr. Frank Cruz at uh, the Community Settlement Association of oh, Riverside, Riverside on January 6, 2011. And uh, we really appreciate your having come here today uh, to, uh, to be interviewed. Uh, if you uh, have uh, any questions or, or also if there's anything you wish not to discuss, just let me know uh, so that I can stop the tape. And um, we appreciate your having filled out the form. Uh, I understand that um, you served, your military service was um, in the 19... I want to say 1957 to 61. I'm sorry, that's I'm using your Yeah, that's Let correct. Let me ask you the questions and you can tell me. When were you in the military? I was, uh, I joined the Air Force in September of 1957, and I was discharged from active duty in September of 1961. So I served four years in the Air Force from 57 to 61. Okay, and you were in Air Police? Right. I, I, I did basic training first that all airmen get at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. And shortly thereafter, upon completion of basic training, uh, I was selected to go to air police school training. And uh, I passed, went through all of the training for being an air policeman, and I, sp I spent the remaining four years, if you will, or almost a total of four years as an air policeman uh, uh, for the Air Force. Um, and s your early experience with uh, wartime um, and uh, military uh, people was uh, in your hometown of Tucson, Arizona? That's correct. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> my mom, uh, had a restaurant in Tucson, Arizona called uh, the Columbia Cafe in a little barrio of Tucson called Barrio Hollywood. We call it affectionately that because in many ways it's the opposite of Hollywood here. But uh, at that cafe, my brother and I used to bust dishes and clean uh, the, the, the restaurant for my mom. And um, I've often said that uh, uh, my first exposure to U.S. soldiers was at that restaurant in the most unusual of ways. Um, I often tell people that some of the fiercest fights that I ever saw in my life were at that restaurant between Chicano Latino soldiers that had been in the Korean War who would get into fist fights with soldiers who had been in World War II. And the fight was basically as to who was the bravest and the boldest and who had served the best. And I'm telling you, those fights would range for hours because uh, one side would say the Korean War vets were the toughest and the World War II vets were say ours was the toughest. And I think that's, uh, it was my first exposure and I think it played a key role later on influencing me in uh, joining the Air Force later on. Yeah. 
And um, after um, you served in the airport, uh, Air Force during the uh, uh, prior to the Vietnam era, uh, did you see similarities between uh, the soldiers who came out of Vietnam and those with uh, from uh, Korea and World War II, or were they completely different? Well, you know, I, I think every generation is exposed to a variety of different kinds of uh, societal and environmental forces. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Vietnam War vets, uh, I think, came back to a somewhat hostile nation that uh, uh, a large percentage of the population was not that approving of the war in Vietnam. And uh, uh, so therefore, I think there weren't great parades and receptions for the Vietnam veterans when they came. It's beginning to change a little bit, but I think in those days it was uh, to a not so friendly environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas previous wars, uh, the Korean and World War II, I think uh, the reception was better and there wasn't as uh, obviously as much hostility as there was uh, an antagonism towards the returning vets from the Vietnamese War. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally speaking, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, and your experiences um, with veterans from uh, Korea informed your knowledge of how the Cold War developed? Yeah, it did. Obviously, the Korean War ended in 1953 uh, with the truce, the armistice, um, and I joined the Air Force in 57. Uh, I was immediately, shortly after basic training and air police school training, I was sent to the Far East. I was in the Philippines for a short period of time. There, uh, the policing duties, we had a variety of them, but one of them involved uh, protecting the base, if you will, from what the Philippine population described as communist members of their country. They called them the Hucks, and we were constantly on guard for Hucks in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was at the height at, of the Cold War right, era. Right, right, uh, at, at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, which is a huge base and we would have to take care of the perimeters and so forth. There were, there were always reports of Hucks coming in and involved in shooting uh, exchanges with uh, air policemen. Then after that, I was transferred up to Taiwan because th I think one of the first throws of the, of the Cold War era began to manifest itself in what is known as the offshore island between Taiwan and communist China. Uh, the Chinese began to heavily bomb the islands separating Taiwan from the mainland, Amoy, Kimoy, Matsu, those islands. And uh, there were uh, not only bombings of those islands, but there were a lot of uh, fighter jet battles between Chinese MiG communist pilots and Taiwanese pilots that were uh, equipped with uh, U.S. Uh, F-86s. Um, it was no match. The Chinese were winning at the time those air battles. Uh, until the United States Air Force decided to send a squadron of F-104 Starfighter jets from Hamilton Air Force Base to Taiwan, the northern end of the island. And uh, I was guarding those jets when they were up and down uh, uh, during those dogfights with the uh, Communist Chinese. So we were able to see the early days of the Cold War manifest itself there with the, uh, the bombings and the uh, fighter pilot uh, uh, off the coast there. And um, where, what did you do after uh, your military service then? Well, I, I, I spent almost three years in the Far East, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Japan. And then my last year was spent at Oxnard Air Force Base uh, here in California. And I was a, an air policeman there and uh, got discharged in September of 1961 and immediately moved from Oxnard to East Los Angeles where I lived with my aunt and started going to East LA College. I had some part-time jobs uh, at a factory uh, loading boxes of canisters and containers and uh, attending school there at East LA College and I, that's where I began my educational career. 
And uh, so you were teaching when the Vietnam War started? Right. I, after East LA College, which I affectionately call sometimes the Chicano Harvard of the West, because so many of the leaders that yeah. have uh, emerged in positions of authority, Latino leaders here in California, uh, went to East LA College. So I, I've always called it that, but it's you know, Chicano Harvard of the West. But uh, then uh, after East LA College, I went to, to USC and uh, got a, uh, a bachelor's degree in history and then also a teaching credential and then a master's degree, and then I started on my PhD work. But while I was doing my PhD work, I taught at uh, uh, first as, at a junior high high school, Lincoln High School in East Los Angeles on North Broadway. And then after Lincoln, I went to Sonoma State University up in the Bay Area, San Francisco area, and then came back down to Cal State Long Beach University and taught history there. And then after that, I went into television. And um, while you were a teacher, um, you, uh, there were starting to be demonstrations against Vietnam? Well, there were, there were a combination of things. You, you have to recall that in the, uh, the 60s was a period of an enormous amount of activism in this country in a variety of ways. The Voting Rights Act, uh, women were beginning to get a lot of uh, their rights. Uh, and uh, you had a lot of protests, you had a lot of civil uh, disruptions and so forth. Um, in the realm of education, while I was teaching at Lincoln Junior High High School, um, there were a lot of protests and concerns by students, parents, and teachers that the Latino students, the Hispanic students in the area were getting an inferior quality of education in a variety of ways. Felt the teachers were inferior, the curriculum wasn't relevant to the students, and it led to a lot of protests and demonstrations asking for educative reform. And I was teaching there at the time, uh, and in 1968, there occurred what is now known as the walkouts of 1968. It began at that high school, but then it spread to other high schools in Los Angeles and then even to other states in the West by students and teachers uh, leading the protest uh, to, to get, uh, to, to dramatize, if you will, the, um, the, the deficiencies that were existing in those days, education-wise. So do you believe that those might have been precursors to uh, the Vietnam War moratorium walkouts later on, or not really? Well, no, the, no, this was after, yeah. Uh, oh, this yeah, is after? Yeah, 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 this was after Vietnam, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, because, right. yeah. But uh, there was a lot of uh, demonstrations at the time uh, <coughs> pertaining to uh, the, the war and protests and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the... The big concern, of course, in, in East L.A. And, and, and in Latino communities across the country was that uh, there was a high percentage of Hispanics uh, who were dying in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, the, the, the protests continued. The one at Lincoln was educative yeah. reform, but simultaneously on the streets, there were a lot of uh, demonstrations. And how did that affect you as a teacher? The, the anti-Vietnam demonstrations? Well, you know, I, I was concerned about it because, uh, you know, there, there were an inordinate amount of, uh, of Latinos and minorities who were uh, dying as a result of the war effort, a disproportionate number to their percentage of the population. So that bothers you in that kind of a context. And um, you also had uh, the draft imposed and that generated an enormous amount of reaction from all walks of life in America, all, all groups. But I think uh, since uh, minorities could see that a very high percentage of those dying on the front lines in Vietnam so happened to be people of color, the demonstrations were pretty strong in those communities. Now the, uh, the uh, education, the um demonstrations uh, for uh, education reforms uh, that happened at Lincoln, I take it, uh, helped lead you to a career in journalism. Uh, well, it, um, 
it, it's, you know, I'm one of those individuals that has had about four or five different careers. And uh, fortunately, I've had a family that's understood my, my, my changes. Uh, mind you, I began as a junior high high school teacher, then went and taught at the state university systems here in California, Sonoma State University, and then Long Beach State. While I was at Long Beach State, uh, <coughs> NBC put together what they call sunrise semesters. And they were very basic fundamental courses on television. English 101 courses, basic history courses, and you know, basic introductory to sociology. or to, And you watched it on the air at home. It was a public interest obligation by the networks in those mm -hmm. days to have these kinds of shows mm -hmm. on early in the morning, 5.30, 6, they called them sunrise semesters. And if you watched it, you wrote a little term paper and they gave you a pass grade for having taken a history course or an English course, a sociology course. NBC asked a group of uh, uh, history professors, of which I was one at the time teaching at Long Beach State University, to do a history series. Uh, a history series on the West uh, and on the history of Latinos in the southwestern part of the United States. We had an educational show, we had a sociological show, a history, I did one on the uh, one show that I did had to do with Mexican immigration to the United States and another one had to do with the Mexican War. I had been doing my graduate work on that. Make a long story short, there were 20 half hour shows uh, done by Chicano studies professors throughout the state of California, different themes and topics. I did two of them, but I was also asked to be the host. So I hosted the series. And I would say today's topic is the education of Latinos, and here is Professor Julian Nava to talk about education. And then I would close it at the tail end, say thank you, Dr. Nava. Next week we're gonna do one on the history and so forth. Well, they reran the series, to make a long story short, NBC reran it, and the news director at ABC saw it, and he called me at Long Beach State, and I didn't take the message, my assistant did, and she says to me, oh, Mr. Cruz, they want to talk to you about the, the history series, and I said, okay, uh, and my first reaction to my assistant was, did we have another sit-in here at the, at the university? Was there a demonstration that, you know, in those days, the height of social activism, dean's offices were taken over, sit-ins at the president's office? And she said, no, 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 it has to do with that history series. So I had to think about it a little bit. So uh, I, talk, I called the news director, uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Fife. Uh, he was the news director at ABC here in Los Angeles, Channel 7. And he called me in and he said, are you interested in news? And I said, sir, I says, I'm a historian. I'm an academician by training. I have a sliced idea about journalism. And he said, why don't you come in and let's talk? So here I had been a junior high high school teacher, a university teacher, and now I was about to embark on another one. I sat down with him and he said, look, television now in the 60s is expanding. We're bringing in lawyers to do consumer reports. We're bringing in meteorologists to do the weather. And you've got the background of the kinds of stories that we need to cover and want to cover. Are you interested in news? And I said, well, let me give it some thought. And, you know, I thanked him. And I was getting ready to walk out the door. And he said, oh, by the way, if you never asked me what we're paying. So he handed me a piece of paper, and I did my best not to blanch. And uh, it was two, three times what I was making at the university. And I said, well, let me, I went home, talked over with my wife, and I said, you know, you know, it's an opportunity. If I reach, you know, 120 students per semester at Long Beach State, here I can reach thousands with these kinds of stories. So I uh, left the university. I had already authored a couple of textbooks. I had uh, tenure with the university, and I embarked upon a career in journalism at, at ABC for, for five years. And then uh, I was there for uh, five, and then I left after covering a lot of immigration stories, a lot of Latino community issues, medical, educative, political, then went to NBC for 10 years. And I was at NBC, first Chicano anchor ever on the airways of Los Angeles. And then um, in 1984, I began, I got together with some other friends and changed into yet another career. This time we purchased a television station in LA, KVEA, El Canal 52, Channel 52, 
uh, made it a, an, at first, an independent Spanish language station competing with uh, KMEX here in LA. And then the following year, we embarked upon setting up Telemundo. So I was one of the founders of Telemundo with stations across the country. And, and you know, so that uh, stayed with that career for X amount of years. And then uh, a partner of mine and I decided to buy an insurance company. And uh, we wound up having the first ever Hispanic owned life insurance company in the country. So that's great. That's four or five different careers right there. And probably as many people uh, know you also for your role in the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Right. In 1992, I was one of about 100 business types, business people in this country who supported President Clinton. Uh, he, his his uh, political path at the time uh, was not heavily endorsed by business types, so he wanted business people. And I was one uh, of about 100 who stood behind him and endorsed uh, President Clinton. And he uh, kept asking me in 92, 93, one of his assistants there, whether I was interested in uh, taking a position with the government. And I said, look, I'm running a company out here and I'm happy and so forth. And then in 94, uh, I said, well, what, what can we, what would be of interest to me? And they made reference to, they said, look, you're a businessman, you've been in television, you're an educator, how about the Corporation for Public Broadcasting? And my first reaction was, what is that? And then, and then, they, uh, and then they described it for me, of course, that it is a, <coughs> excuse me, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is the entity that oversees what most people know as PBS and NPR. Oh, <coughs> I need some water here. So we were talking <coughs> about, about CPB. Uh, yes. <coughs> the uh, I joined the board of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in uh, 1994, and uh, I stayed on the board. Uh, you're allowed a six-year term, President of the United States nominate you and then you're approved by the Senate. So you can have two six-year terms. I stayed an almost complete 13th year. So I was, uh, <clears throat> simply because they needed, um, they hadn't gone through the process of finding a replacement and so forth for me. <clears throat> so I was on the board for almost 12 and a half years on the CPB board. And that is the entity that, if you will, receives an annual appropriation from Congress. And then we, in turn, in a formulaic kind of a way, re-grant that to 350-some-odd, what most people know as PBS stations, and re-grant it also to 700-some-odd public radio stations. And um, uh, CPB winds up being the uh, not only the overseer, if you will, <clears throat> but also the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, largest single source of funding for PBS stations and for uh, the radio stations across the country. <clears throat> and, and you became chair of the... Right, I was chair. <clears throat> <clears throat> I can never forget, it was during 9-11. So I was, chair, uh, I was chair in 1999, 2000, and 2001 when I was chair of uh, CPB. <clears throat> and um, during the time that you were at CPB, um, uh, documentarian Ken Burns uh, made a uh, series of uh, programs about World War II mm -hmm. uh, that caused a bit of a stir. Right. Uh, the, um, l let me add before I forget, <clears throat> during those almost 13 years that I was on the board of CPB, not only was I the first Hispanic ever to head public broadcasting, but I was also the first minority, period. There never had been one. So I was the first. Um, uh, CPB provides the initial funding, the seed money, if you will, to a lot of uh, producers, independent and also to the producing television stations like WGBH in Boston or NET in New York or WIDA in Washington, D.C. And uh, one of the producers that we provided funding for over the years, if you will, was Ken Burns. Um, when I first joined the board back in 1994, 
I remember funding his jazz series. And there were several others, baseball and others that he did over the years. And I also remember funding the one that he did for World War II. And he indicated to us then when he got the initial funding, and some, it, it took him about two, three, four years to finally complete the World War II project. He was very emphatic in telling us that it was not going to be like your traditional World War II documentaries, that this one uh, was going to be unique for a variety of reasons. He was going to uh, look at four sections of the country and to see how each section of the country reacted to war. What did people do in their communities and how were they involved and the relatives that they sent off to war. He was going to have someone in the south, the east, the midwest, and in the west. And um, uh, the, the coverage, uh, he said, would, would also be unique in addition to approaching it from that standpoint, from a, on the street level as to reactions to World War II and the involvement of everyday Americans in World War II. But also that there was going to be a lot of unique footage that uh, heretofore had been in the archives taken during World War II that he was going to use, which he wound up doing. Uh, so I was there for the funding of that project. And then as timing would have it, if you will, uh, one of my last meetings at C as a CPB director in 2006, before I left, I left in 2007, one of my last meetings, uh, producers come in and show us a little pilot, if you will, a little trailer, they call it, a little vignette highlight of the series. And I saw it and think anything, you know, it, it looked like they were using a lot of original footage and it had shots of families in different parts of the country talking about how, you know, one son went to war and another one, they had to work in the farms to, to make up and, and to be able to feed the family and another uncle went and worked at a, at a plane manufacturing factory. So it was uh, from that kind of a perspective. Uh, I didn't see anything there that pertained to the war record or uh, mentioning of uh, the, the African American experience or the Navajo code talkers or anything like that. It looked like a generic one on World War II. Well, uh, I left uh, shortly thereafter. My term was up at CPB. And I then got wind of the fact or I heard that uh, uh, someone had seen a broader version of his show and that uh, they had mentioned the war experience of other individuals and not of, uh, that, and that the Hispanic soldier uh, experience had been left out. And I had to immediately call and ask, well, why was it like that? That wasn't the impression of the kind of show that I thought. Well, uh, I, I got a call from the hierarchy of PBS asking me, telling me that there was this controversy brewing across the country uh, Hispanic groups complaining that there wasn't, uh, there wasn't the mention of Hispanic soldiers. And they said, what do you think of it, Frank? And I said, well, I said, you're, you're really asking me a very sensitive question. And I had to tell them that when I was a youngster growing up in Tucson, I used to clean a restaurant that my mom owned. And I often tell people that some of the most bitter, vicious fights that I ever saw in my life were between Chicano Korean War vets fighting it, duking it out with Chicano vets from World War II over the fact as to who, had, who was toughest and who had really fought and who had had a tough war. And uh, I explained that to the people at PBS and I said, you know, not to include the Latino war experience, I says, is wrong. I says, if you're going to do that, if you're going to mention others, then you should. My impression of the special was otherwise. Uh, but now that there is mention of that, then you can't omit the Hispanic version. And I think that and a variety of other factors ultimately led to inclusion of Latinos in the series uh, by producers that they brought on, but it was sort of like an afterthought. Okay, and um, in addition to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, you since then you've also um, participated in other large uh, organizations. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, board work? Right. Well, I'm, I'm a trustee of the University of Southern California where uh, I've been a trustee now for 11 years. And I'm also 
uh, a member of the board of the James Irvine Foundation here in California. And, uh, you know, those, you know, keep me extremely occupied. Mm -hmm. And going back quite a bit <clears throat> um, to, uh, to your journalism days, I sh should ask you how it was that you came about uh, being one of the founders of uh, CCNMA, mm -hmm. which well, is uh, the, uh, originally the California Chicano, Chicano News, News Media <coughs> Association. Correct, right. Well, it was, uh, <clears throat> it, it's very typical of what um, uh, was occurring in society at the time and has historically occurred. Uh, you form a uh, <clears throat> an organization or a partnership with uh, individuals that have a common professional or educational interest. Um, many of us who joined the media, the general media in those days, be it print or electronic, uh, uh, we were sort of the first wave, if you will, at any of those stations. There weren't that many Latinos at CBS or at NBC or at ABC, Fox wasn't around in those days, and at the Los Angeles Times and other newspapers. Uh, the uh, percentage of Hispanics at, the, at, at those institutions were very, very small. <clears throat> those of us that were in positions at the ABCs, NBCs, and so at the time I was at ABC, uh, we felt that um, we, uh, uh, by forming a professional organization, the California Chicano News Media Association, that we would be not only helping ourselves professionally by providing training and assistance to each other, uh, but our secondary function was to generate scholarships for students to go through journalism schools so that there would certainly be this pipeline of Latinos coming into the industry. Because up to, up to that time, uh, the, the coverage of uh, uh, the Latino experience in the United States was very, very uh, was limited and what little was there uh, had a tendency to be uh, very, very biased, um, uh, a tendency to primarily depict Latinos as recent arrival immigrants and I always would, used to say, yes, some arrived last night, but there have been some here that have been here for two, three hundred years. So, um, and also uh, as primarily as gang members or as undocumented aliens. And we, we felt that professionally, uh, like any good newsroom, your editors and your assignment people need to be sensitive as to who your readership or your audience is, be it radio or television or print. And we wanted better coverage in that kind of a kind. And we formed the organization in that sense. No. And, um, <clears throat> And who, who formed the organization? Well, there were, gosh, it was just a handful of us in those days, you know, who, uh, there was an attorney by the name of Herman C.S. in Los Angeles who had an office on 3rd Street, and it was conveniently located for us. Uh, Frank Delolmo of the Los Angeles Times, uh, Joel Garcia, at the, at the time he worked with uh, uh, KTTV, myself, uh, Henry Alfaro, there were Bob Navarro, there were, so there was a, a handful of folks that were involved, and we were we even brought in uh, members from the Hispanic press, you know, KMEX, no no Telemundo at the time, that mm -hmm. came later, but at the time, um, uh, uh, journalist from uh, KMEX, so we always had the English and the Hispanic component part in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, CCNMA was founded in 1972, mm -hmm. and uh, it's still doing the scholarship yeah. Yeah. Uh, program right. and its right. other programs. Right. Um, and uh, let me see. The other um, thing I wanted to ask you about the. Um, uh, let me see. Your, um, your experience with um, uh, war eras, um, the World War II, as a, a child you're seeing the vets and Korea, um, the, uh, the Vietnam 
uh, war at that time you were teaching and mm -hmm. then starting in journalism? Did you have any coverage? No, I, I was still, no, I was still in teaching. Yeah, the, okay. Yeah, and that was sixty-seven, sixty-eight. I was still. Sixty-eight. Yeah. Okay, because right. uh, and sixty-nine. And, and sixty-nine. Okay, and then um, have. Yeah, I didn't go did, to ABC until seventy-one. So. Did you, Did your experiences meeting veterans of the various wars and your own experience uh, in the service? Uh, did that affect your life and what you've done with it since? Well, you know, you're often asked in life, uh, what were some of the memorable experiences in your life? And I must admit that clearly the most influential person in my life was my mom, no question. Left a widow with two boys and had to raise two children. Uh, it was not an easy task. The other factor that had and played a key role in my life, I would say, was the military. Um, in, the, in the sense that I had lived up to the time I joined the Air Force in a very, very segregated community in Tucson, Arizona. I thought everybody was Mexican. I didn't know there were other people in this world. And I land at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. The recruiting class had been assembled from throughout the country, and we landed there. And now here are totally non-Hispanic last names, non-Hispanic individuals from all over the country. So it really was an eye-opener for me uh, in the sense that it exposed me to diversity. It exposed me to other parts of the country geographically and other parts of the world, and it taught me a heck of a lot of discipline. So those key factors really played a key role in my life. And uh, it also propelled me to see, I used to wonder, why does that guy have a bar up here and I've got a stripe? And then it dawns on you that they went to school. So education uh, kept playing a key role in my life in that sense. So the military was certainly one of the key uh, experiences and, and, and influencing factors in my life, no question about it. It took me out of that barrio of Tucson and exposed me to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought everybody ate tortillas and beans. I kid you not. And uh, I have to tell you a funny story. Landed at Lackland Air Force Base with that group of, of uh, incoming recruits from throughout the country. And uh, we landed late at night, which was about 9 o'clock. Normally, you get there early. And the process immediately begins to take you away from civilian life to military life. They cut your hair, all your clothes are taken off, your civilian's clothes, and sent back, and they give you military clothes from shoes, socks, underpants, to the hat, to everything. Well, they couldn't do it for that particular group of airmen that night that arrived, the recruits. I being one of them, because we landed late. So they took us to the cafeteria still dressed in our civilian clothes, the military chow hall. And they said, grab a tray, walk down the line, and if you see something on the other side that you like, stick your tray in. If you don't like it, keep walking. So if you wanted eggs or whatever it was. So, mind you, I had eaten beans and chorizo all my life, and I'm looking at this now, and I'm saying, wow. And I kept going down the line, and I looked over a couple of spaces, and there was a stack. I said, gee, those look like tortillas. Turned out to be they were pancakes that they were pouring syrup on. But that was, <laughs> I said, oh, wow. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, but that was my, I mean, that's how, you know, uh, I got indoctrinated to other different foods. But you also got care packages from home when you were, yourself yeah. was in the... Uh, you know, I often wonder why, why those care packages that my mom sent me ever got there as quick as they did. I think it was military air transport service, almost about as fast as FedEx and UPS nowadays. But it got there very quickly. I think it was military transport that they used. But she would send me, once a month, uh, beans and tortillas that she made. And uh, uh, a couple of the other Chicano kids that were with me there really loved that package when it got there because, well, we said, you know, home cooking here. Um, I used to work the different shifts and when I had the midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning shift, I would make myself a burrito there at the barracks, wrap it up in aluminum foil, and take it with me 
so around three in the morning when I was hungry. Well, uh, the, the place where I was assigned, we had some F-104 jets that would come and go. And the F-104 jet is literally a, a, a missile, an intake and an exhaust. And when those jets would come back and land, they were, the, the exhaust stayed hot for hours. And three o'clock in the morning, I would conveniently put my burrito in there, heat it up and have a hot burrito at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> in northern Taiwan, in China. Isn't that something? That's very good. Yeah. Um, and going back for just a moment uh, to the Ken Burns series, did you ever speak with Ken Burns? Well, I, you know, I did not with the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the World War II series because I had just left by then. I could have called him, uh, but I didn't. Uh, but over the years, oh, absolutely, I, I knew Ken Burns, know Ken Burns quite well. Mm -hmm. and, and talk to them about all the other series that we used to fund. Like mm -hmm. I said, we had a, had a jazz series, had a baseball series, and so forth. And then this one had come in as a World War II mm -hmm. series. But not when, not when the last one was controversial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked to the okay. hierarchy at PBS. And, okay. Yeah. And um, we haven't uh, really mentioned that you, uh, you had a successful uh, business. Right. Um, uh, as, oh, yes, you did mention that. The, te, the I'm tele, sorry. Well, yes, te, you tele, did. Telemundo, and then after um, Telemundo was, um, we, um, we had such a great success with the independent station first, KVEA, that the parent group said, can you put a network together for us, referring to about nine of us. Uh, and, uh, and we said, yes, we can. And they asked, well, how do you do it? I said, well, there's different ways. You can buy time in stations in Hispanic markets, like from 5 to 8 at night, and just keep building and building that way. Uh, or they said, you can, um, uh, they said, but that takes time. They said, well, how can you do it quickly? Well, quickly meant that we, I said, you buy stations. And they said, well, why don't we go that route? So we bought the John Blair Entertainment Company, and we wound up having a station in, Florida, Spanish language, and one in Puerto Rico. And then from Norman Lear and Jerry Parencho, we bought WNJU in Secaucus, New Jersey, and then got one in Chicago. We had the LA one and one up in the Bay Area, so the core nucleus was there, the critical mass for the network. And that's how it got launched in 1985, 86. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, at a time, mind you, when people yeah. were saying, you'll never make it, you're going to get killed. And I, well, <laughs> those are fighting words to me. So we, we, proved, we proved them wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, going back <clears throat> to uh, how uh, the experiences relating to wars uh, have informed uh, your own experience, what do you think now when you see all of these uh, young people very eagerly going into the armed, now that there's no draft, very yeah. eagerly going right. into the armed forces and uh, going to Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, you know, it, um, you know, my hat's off to them for, for, for being part of it because I think they're, in a sense, uh, involved in the preservation of freedoms and so forth that, that we enjoy. Uh, what bothers me is that it isn't equitable. Uh, this is an all-volunteer army who are doing two or three tours of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, if you have a draft, then it becomes equitable. Then everybody, whether you're rich, poor, you know, one racial group or another, you all get thrown into the kitty. So uh, on the one hand, I laud them for what they're doing, and there's a lot of respect. I mean doing two or three tours, I mean, that, that is, uh, you know, very, very difficult on people and on families. But, you know, they're, they're volunteering, if you will. Uh, whereas if there were a draft, then uh, it would be a more equitable type of a, of a relationship. And of course, you know, I'm not sure that people would want to relive and recreate the draft right now again. Okay, yeah. So you're not necessarily advocating the reinstitution yeah. right. of the draft. Okay. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add? Uh, you know, other than the fact that uh, not long ago I was in France 
and because of those war of those early fights in my little mom's cafe, um, I, I wanted to. Uh, I, I took a tour in France, and I specifically wanted to go up to the, to visit the beaches of. Remember, there were five beaches. Utah and Omaha were American. Sword, Gold, and Juno, mm -hmm. uh, British. Uh, allied forces and so forth at the other three, but without a doubt, uh, Omaha and Utah were... These were the, the key beaches involved in, in the Normandy the, in invasion. In no, Normandy invasion, the, June 6, 1944. Right. Okay. In Europe. Right, in France, right. But uh, it, um, even if you don't know anyone that is buried there by name, it is a very moving and emotional experience. Uh, from the standpoint that um, First of all, the location of the cemetery, which the French have see, given to the United States, so it's now run as a U.S. cemetery. The 10,000 soldiers that are buried there are on a bluff that overlooks Omaha Beach, where many of them died. Uh, the cemetery itself, all of the crosses carry the individual's name, the date of birth, date of death, and the state that they were from. I walked up and down the aisles of those crosses, and I got to tell you, a uh, lot of Latino soldiers, very, very young. So in a sense, it was hearkening back to when I was at, in Tucson growing up as a youngster in Barrio Hollywood and watching the fights between the Korean War vets and the World War II vets and completing the circle now by going over there and seeing exactly where many of them died and are buried. It, uh, it's, uh, you know, quite a, a moving experience because of the, uh, that was the largest invasion ever. And, uh, uh, I mean, England's only 26 kilometers from there. And the Germans were heavily entrenched. And, uh, the, you know, the fight and the warfare that went under the Allied powers there under General Eisenhower really was something. And the onslaught, they tell you, of the first waves that landed at Omaha and Utah uh, you know, 50% of them died, you know, so, but anyway, it was a complete circle for me, a closing of the loop from the days that I used to see these fights as a, as a youngster in Tucson to being at Normandy there here recently. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.